Hi guys, this is Jason of Dalcoin. I'm here with the review of the Sony Xperia 1. This year Sony decided not to call it the Xperia XZ4, but rather start a new chapter with the Xperia 1, unveiled at Mobile World Congress 2019. Of course, it's a very long phone, it inaugurated a 21 to 9 aspect ratio and it's a multimedia beast. Sony also moved on to a triple back camera and it actually bundled this flagship with a few appealing offers. In some countries, they're throwing in free headphones, 1000X uh, M3 for example, which are worth $350 separately. And in some countries, they're even offering TV sets bundled with the phone as a bonus. Anyways, the price tag that this handset comes at at least in USA is $950, it's a flagship and it's available in black, grey, purple, white and it's got a Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 CPU inside, meaning it's a flagship and it means business. So let's talk about the design because there's a lot to talk about. 6.5 inches, that's the diagonal here, it's a phone made for landscape usage but also for vertical usage if you're planning on doing some serious scrolling. I had my doubts, I was a non-believer about the format, but then again, it's so narrow that it's easy to grip with the hand. There are times when it feels slippery on account of the very glossy area here. It may be metal covered with something, some plastic material or special paint, but it makes this thing a bit slippery. My other problem with the design is the fact that the power button is way too low, I never find it, I actually end up pressing the uh, volume down button a lot. On the other hand, at least the Fingerprint scanner is spot on and pretty fast. Anyways, glass at the back, glass at the front, metal in between, a long phone which is easy to use with a single hand if you plan on gripping it properly and doing a lot of scrolling. And of course, landscape is a champ on account of having these big top and bottom bezels. Okay, so it's going to polarize some people for sure. It's got IP65 and IP68 certification for water and dust proofing. It's a simple design, rather rectangular with big bezels at the top and bottom. And frankly speaking, it's prettier in real life compared to renders and pictures. Not very sold about the camera placement or the look of the backside, but once again, polarizing and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Okay, and I just want to make a quick mention, the box of the phone feels a bit cheap. You're not selling groceries here, Sony, you're selling phones. Now on the display front, I keep mentioning, this is a 21 to 9 aspect ratio screen. It's called Cinema Wide, it's a 4K screen, HDR, OLED, all the good things, Gorilla Glass 6. The actual resolution is 3840 over 1644 pixels, it's got DCI-P3 100% calibration. Okay, so usually this is the part where I show you our typical test video, but aside from showing that, I feel the need to show you something else because just stretching it doesn't work anymore. Anyways, my opinion about this is that we're dealing with a quite immersive screen. It's also rather bright and crisp, nice, nicely calibrated colors. It's got deep blacks like a typical OLED, wide view angles, and great contrast in the sunlight, but once again I feel the need to actually show you more and I'm going to go ahead and look for a special 4K HDR test video, here we go, to really put it to the test. Okay, so this is it, let's go full screen and make sure, it actually comes from Sony, so it doesn't get better than that, 4K. Okay, so now we're in 4K. And now we're going to go full screen. Let's actually make sure, yes, it's 4K. Let's turn down the music to avoid any copyright problems. And here we go. That's what a 4K HDR OLED screen looks like on the Sony Xperia 1. I don't know if it goes to the camera to you, but I'm totally blown away by the quality here. It's being very underestimated, but I'm very happy with the experience. And I'm also happy with the games, Netflix and all that. Quick reminder, uh, there's a huge difference between 100%, 90% brightness and 80% and 70%. After 90% it goes very low and that's rather odd. Anyways, uh, it's time to see our tests and all the things we did with this handset. So this is the pixel arrangement. It's of the Pentile Matrix variety. And uh, we also did a bunch of brightness tests and the biggest result we achieved was 472 lux units in brightness. This is good, but it's definitely no record. Look at what we achieved recently with the OnePlus 7 Pro and the AllView Solix 6 Extreme. Anyways, 
this value beats the Samsung Galaxy Note 9 and also the Galaxy S10e and the Galaxy S10 Plus. It scores below the Sony Xperia XZ2, the Nokia 9 PureView and the Xperia XZ3 as well as the uh, Huawei P30 Pro. Of course, there's a lot of calibration that you can apply here. So you can go to display and you can choose your image quality settings. You have the creator mode, you have the standard mode, you have the auto creator mode, uh, video image enhancement. You can tweak the white balance options like warm, medium, cool or custom plus the RGB sliders. This uh, creator mode is actually more useful if you're planning on actually doing some work or viewing some work on the device. By work, I mean video editing properly calibrated stuff, brightness level, adaptive brightness, sleep, phone size, display size and sight sense, one-handed mode, smart backlight, nightlight and screen saver. Those are all options. I'm going to focus on sight sense later on. Okay, so I'm very happy with the screen here. It's 4K HDR and OLED. Some people don't even have a TV with those features. And I'm going to go further now into the hardware. We got a Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 inside, a flagship CPU, together with 6 GB of RAM and 120 GB of storage, plus a microSD card slot. Obviously, the phone can run any game you can imagine. We can run Fortnite, you can run uh, uh, Arena of Valor, you can run uh, Darkness Rises. Uh, of course, you can run Asphalt 9, also Need for Speed, or whatever you want, you can run it. With maximum level of details, PUBG, of course, and even that brand new game, it's called Disorder. You can find the APK file on the NetEase website. It's basically a sort of Apex Legends on mobile. It's called Disorder and it's going to be the next big thing. It's in beta for now. Let's leave that this aside and we're playing Riptide GP Renegade, which looks pretty fine here. Notice the frame rate, the excellent details. Would make a pretty nice gaming phone, to be frank, and the water drops. And once again, you can tweak the details all the way to the max. So I didn't notice any lag, any problem on any sort of things like that. Even though if it's a very hot weather outside and you're using the camera a lot, it can give you a message that the device is too hot. Now in the benchmark department, let's see how we did. And we can actually go to the folders and see the screenshots. Of course, we did on Tutu, Nanomark and so forth. Just let me look for them here because as usual i have a ton of screenshots this is the antutu result antutu 7 it beats the samsung galaxy s10e and the huawei mate 20 pro as well as the oneplus 7 pro which is no small feat it scores below the galaxy s10 plus and of course below the asus zenfone 6 which kind of dominates our tests for now we also did a geekbench 4 sub test and let's see what came out of that Pretty impressive result in the multi-core subtest. It beats the Samsung Galaxy S10e and also the Huawei P30 Pro, but scores below the Galaxy S10 Plus and the iPhone XR. Aside from this test, we also did one that handles the graphics. Let's check it out here. So it's Slingshot Extreme ES 3.1, and I have to say I'm pretty impressed by this one. Not a bad result. It even beats the gaming phone Asus ROG phone and the Galaxy S10 Plus, but scores below the OnePlus 60 and below the Zenfone 6. It uh, places third, which is actually not bad. In general, it managed to reach the top 10 in most benchmarks, so it handles the tests and performance quite okay. Now, I want to talk about the temperature because, as you know, we always perform temperature tests. And here we achieve 35.8 degrees Celsius in the game you saw before, uh, Riptide GP Renegade, while at the same time we achieved 41.7 degrees Celsius, which is pretty high in GFX Bench. So in benchmarks, it works a bit harder, and you can see that on the thermometer. And at some point, we even got as high as 48.5 degrees Celsius as a maximum value in a hot point here and once again during benchmark so you shouldn't worry too much however in hot weather and after filming a lot the device may overheat uh, now it's time for the battery test and people were worried 4k screen oled hdr 6.5 inches with only a 3330 milliamp hour battery at least it has fast charge or does it anyways let's see what we achieved and uh, i'm going to start off with the usual HD video playback test in a loop. Let's see what we got from that. Should have it here somewhere. 
oh here we go it's actually 11 hours and 29 minutes that's video playback basically watching netflix watching movies watching whatever you want it's a pretty solid result it's not groundbreaking but still pretty good at 11 hours 29 minutes it beats nokia 9 pure view it beats sony xperia xz3 scores below the huawei honor view 20 and the iphone 10r as well as the xiaomi mi mix 3 now you already got a spoiler before for the pc mark continuous usage and here we go this is the work battery life, the continuous usage is 10 hours and 9 minutes. Not bad at all, superior to the Google Pixel 3 XL, the Asus ROG phone and the Huawei Mate 20 Pro. It scores below the Huawei P30 Pro and the OnePlus 7 Pro for sure. Charging is 1 hour and 46 minutes on the long side considering that other phones out there manage to charge in below 1 hour. And at least after 1 hour of juicing up the phone you get 82% battery. Now the settings you may be familiar with them. Um, you can tweak the battery settings from here. You got your stamina mode, you got your ultra stamina mode with several sub settings and this is actually a way to only use basic features on the phone the ultra stamina and get up to three days of usage on paper and we also have adaptive battery uh, that has been the battery to be honest it performed above my expectations and i want to talk about these stereo speakers now because it's time for the acoustics this is the earpiece uh, also the top speaker for the music and this is the bottom speaker you can see it right here next to the usb type c Okay, so I'm going to put them to the test. Uh, it's probably going to get a bit finicky because the music app will not see the music. I know it's odd, but it happens every once in a while. So we go to files and we have to listen it to it from here and open it like this. Okay, so uh, you will not cover the speaker here when holding the phone in landscape, it barely escapes it. My impression is that we're dealing with a loud and clear experience, not much bass. I wanted more bass. It's got an okay voice and high notes and I feel that the top speaker is not as strong as the bottom speaker. Also the whole vibration thing, you probably know that we have a special uh, dynamic vibration here. You can see it and you can tweak it from here. It actually distracts me from the song rather than help with the bass and it's not always synchronized. The bundle headphones are comfy, loud and have good bass and they can totally fill your ear because they're rather big. Weird stuff, we don't have an audio jack and we actually have to get an adapter which is bundled with the phone to hook up to the 3.5mm connector of the headphones. I know it's rather odd. Uh, no FM radio that I know of. Let's see here, Facebook files, nope, no FM radio. And now it's time for the typical decibel meter test that we do. So let's fire it up and I'm going to start with this low value here, 76.8 decibels, that's what we achieved at the top of the phone and uh, it's definitely not impressive but uh, um, at the bottom of the phone you can achieve 91 decibels which is more solid for sure, superior to the Huawei P30 Pro, Galaxy S10 Plus by even 8 decibels but it's inferior to the Google Pixel 3 XL and the Motorola Moto G7 Plus. This has been the audio sample test and we also have a gaming test. This one is done in Riptide GP Renegade and we scored a decent 98 0.4 decibels it's okay it beats the samsung galaxy s10e galaxy s10 plus and nokia 9 pureview scores below the huawei p30 pro and you also have some settings here if you go into audio and you really dig in you got your dolby atmos with several modes dynamic movie music and custom which you can actually tweak from here intelligent equalizer dialogue enhancer and all of that plus DSEEHX to hear the compressed music in high resolution if possible. Okay, now it's time to talk about the camera or better said cameras because there's quite a bit of them. So this is the first triple camera Sony phone. That's for sure. Got a triple camera setup on the backside. Uh, all these three sensors are 12 megapixel ones. We got an LED flash here. So as far as I know, the bottom one should be the wide angle camera 
it's a 12 megapixel shooter it's actually a ultra wide 130 degree camera and we also have the main 12 megapixel camera with an xmor rs sensor and optical stabilization plus f1.6 aperture there's actually here we got hybrid stabilization a combination of optical and electronic the camera also does 960 frames per second super slow-mo video and also has a g lens and a raw capture support and finally, we got the third camera, which is also 20, excuse me, a 12 megapixel shooter, f2.4 aperture, optical image stabilization, and uh, actually hybrid and 2x optical zoom. So once again, three 12 megapixel shooters here. There's the wide angle, there's the main one, and the 2x optical zoom. There's hybrid autofocus, there's eye focus, eye tracking focus, there's bokeh, 3D creator, 4K HDR, there's everything in the kitchen sink, as the Americans say, a lot of stuff. And also a special Cinema Pro app from Cine Alta with a special Hollywood style capture. I'm going to get into that later. At the front, a simple 8 megapixel camera on the top side for the selfies with HDR in its own flavor of steady shot and bokeh. Uh, now the camera UI felt a bit confusing for me, you have to go here to find your modes, uh, there's no trace of HDR unless you access the manual mode, so that's a bit weird, and the actual integration of the viewfinder is small on this large screen. And I should also mention that when taking a low light photo, particularly in very dark scenarios, the processing of the shot is so long that it reminded me of the bad Nokia 9 Pure View, and that's bad. Okay, now, when it comes to the actual gallery, boy, do we have photos. We actually have a ton of photos. They are taken during the day, during the night. We have some street food festival shots, uh, some park shots. Actually, two sets of shots because uh, there was a darker day and a brighter day. But I'm going to start with the regular one. So, first things first. The colors are calibrated pretty okay. I'm happy with the zoom at least at first sight. We also took some wide angle shots, but they feel a bit too curved for my taste. You'll see those later on. Even more zoom. I would say the details are pretty well kept and the colors are okay. But once again, in later shots, the zoom seemed to impress me less. At about two or three X, strings are okay, but go further than that and you have a problem. One thing that was constant here is the fact that the phone always caught the sky being simply a white smudge. Never the blue we saw on the OnePlus 7 Pro. Bunch of selfies, but they're with eyeglasses and I never take them into account. We need proper eyes. And I have to say it again, I'm happy with the color calibration, but I wanted more life out of them. I don't know how to say it. They just don't breathe life. If you look at the iPhone shots or the Samsung shots, the Huawei shots, they breathe color and life. Those ones are flat. And to be honest, most times I actually messed with the exposure because they're simply too dark so keep that in mind i was a bit underwhelmed here expected a bit more especially since i like the xperia xz2 and xz1 very much xz3 not so much more colors here and this is where the disappointment comes not impressed by the zoom not impressed by the wide angle that curves the image a lot uh, at least the colors are okay in my view even though they're not popping like they're doing on the rival phones and finally, we got the selfies, which are honestly speaking not bad. They're a bit dark, but I love the skin texture, the way the pores are shown here and all the lines, the expression lines, I have to say they're actually better than most phones. So texture and expression lines, but maybe some extra brightness and clarity next time. Also, not very impressed by the bokeh shots. I'm talking about the portrait bokeh shots. And here we got to the second part of the gallery. We took some bokeh shots here. I would say they're decent, but nowhere near the Huawei Mate 20 Pro and P30 Pro. You can see the bokeh here and the focusing. Uh, not mind-blowing. They feel something like a, out of a high mid-ranger. Excellent flower shots, though. Those ones are pretty impressive, even though I had to work hard for them. I actually had to focus a lot to get them right. And the phone struggles to focus when you're taking macros, close-ups and playing with these beautiful flowers. So keep that in mind. Even more selfies and I'm pretty happy with what we achieved here. Dubious expression or not. Nice hair texture, skin texture. So if you're going for that, you'll be happy. But once again, they feel a bit dark and uh, not the best colors behind me. Here I played with the bokeh and the focus yet again and with the colors in the park. It's a darker area of the park with more shade. 
and you can clearly see that things are being a bit burnt in the background so you can probably tell i'm not very impressed by the phone and this is another set of shots for a street food festival some of them are actually blurry on the sides and too white on the sides and the sky is once again a white smudge don't get me wrong they're not bad but they don't pop the colors do not pop the panorama is uh, 24656 over 3488 pixels and it's a bit curved but the details are pretty generous okay so conclusions i would have to say that the phone let me down in close-up focus bokeh shots the zoom was pretty good but up to a smaller level the wide angle shots are too curved the sky is not well captured it's basically a white smudge and the colors don't pop it's more of a pragmatical camera but it doesn't stand a chance against the huawei p30 pro galaxy s10 or the oneplus 7 pro so too bad for sony this year it can maybe beat a nokia 9 pure view but that's that that's daytime let's go to the night time well, to be honest i was pretty impressed by the color calibration and also by the clarity but lighting was not exactly top notch here so they need a bit more lighting but in general i was happy with the quality uh, the street light halos are shown pretty okay they're not overblown they have some extra lines as you can see here okay level of yellow decent zoom at least at first if you look at these shots on the pc they will be less impressive in general uh, it passed my test it handles the low light scenarios okay for a flagship it can maybe take on a galaxy s10 i would say and also the oneplus 7 pro maybe if it weren't for those pesky lines and the quantity of light caught i would have to say it would be a champ but not fully anyways and sometimes when taking those wide angle shots the halos will look a bit weird but the biggest surprise was definitely and the most impressive one was definitely the low light capture instead of the day time capture once again the photos are good spot on well focused and decently lit colorful but uh, they don't pop and they're not memorable now let's talk about the video okay so here we are in the video department and i guess i'm going to go ahead and use the mx uh, player application we have quite a few videos and let's start them off with the daytime one so this is video number one and I have to say that things look a bit burnt by the strong sunlight. I'm very happy with the clarity here and the quality of the image. But the sky may look a bit weird and may look a bit white on account of the sunlight. Once again, not a huge burn, but later on you'll see other videos where that becomes a problem for vegetation. Uh, we have another video here. As you can see, it's pretty shaky. Stabilization doesn't seem to be the strong suit of the phone. Clarity remains spot on every time, especially if you're dealing with 4K. And then we have this video here. It's taken from a concert. That's the stage. We cannot play you the music because it's YouTube copyright and all that jazz. But I can tell you that the microphone handles it like a champ. And we have the sunlight in front of us. And in spite of that, things are pretty decent. And this is one of the rare cases where uh, there wasn't as severe of a burn as on the other videos. Okay, this is the zoom. Uh, not very impressive if you really go in depth and uh, that's about it now let's try other videos okay uh i think it's time to go to this one here which is actually the stabilization test we're walking around the park and lo and behold uh, at least this stabilization test doesn't feature any flicker you know you've seen quite a few phones shaking the image flickering but this one has a strange sort of ghostly look at the top of the image this area is totally white on account of the sun doesn't seem to handle the sun very well and creates a foggy aspect okay and we have even more videos i'm not totally decided if i'm happy with the color calibration or not in general the colors were okay spot on decently calibrated but they simply do not pop as the colors of a Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus or Huawei P30 Pro do. Those ones also tend to suffer from overexposure every once in a while, but uh, this one actually suffers from it a bit more. Now, selfie video, we also have that here. And here we go. This is the selfie video. Not the worst in the world for an 8 megapixel camera, but also not the best. I mean, you can clearly see there's not a lot of detail here. The face texture is okay, but the lack of detail and a sort of shadowy look doesn't flatter you if you want to become a vlogger. And even more videos here. This is taken from the top. It was already after dark. 
Once again, clarity is never a problem, the microphone is okay, but then again, not memorable shots. And this is an area where we tested the zoom, uh, excuse me, we tested the autofocus, which seems to be handled pretty okay. So focus checks out, stabilization so-so. I remember back in the day where I was fascinated by the stabilization of the Sony Xperia XZ1 and XZ1 Compact. Don't know what happened to that. So basically, if you stick to 4K, you should be reasonably happy with the result, even though the images do not pop as they did on the Galaxy S10 Plus. Okay, and here we actually have a comparison. I took the same video three times in a row with a regular camera, uh, with the wide angle camera and with the HDR option. Uh, this is the regular one. And then we have the HDR one, which should actually be seen on an HDR screen to really take advantage of it. Somehow it feels framey. It also feels framey on my PC, a bit choppy. You can almost see the frames. And this is the wide angle one, a bit too curved and a bit too burnt by the sun. So there were times when I felt the need to compare this phone to the Nokia 9 Pure View, which also burned quite a few of the videos, but this one doesn't do that as badly. And we also went to a street food festival and uh, at the same event we used the OnePlus 7 Pro. And I have to admit that the OnePlus 7 Pro filmed better than the Xperia one. Once again, don't get me wrong, the filming is okay, but stabilization is a bit of a letdown, the colors don't pop and the captures are not memorable. So you're better off with the other flagships. That's daytime. We also took a nighttime video. It's this one here. And to be honest, it's quite good. Like I was surprised in the photo department. I'm also surprised in the video department. So uh, it's a pretty natural low light video. There's no flicker, there's no stabilization problem. So we got a yellow hue here, which is natural. The image is a bit darker than we usually see on flagships, but even the halos are fine. Nice panning. So not bad, to be honest, not that bad, except for when you zoom in and you lose a bit of quality. Of course, I also made use of the Cinema Pro feature. There's a lot of stuff to do here. I also took a slow motion video. You can see it here and enjoy it. This is the super slow motion video. Pretty impressive, I'll admit. And then it stops. And as I said before, there's a ton of videos here with the Cinema Pro. Uh, it's the Cine Alta app with a lot of stuff to tweak. You can change the ISO, shutter, focus, uh, choose the camera. You're taking 24 frames per second, 4K uh, HDR video at uh, H265. That's the standard. And some of these videos are actually quite eye-catching. So basically you can create a scenario, you can create a narration using a combination of filters, shutter, ISO and so forth. And then you can create a stunning video, you can tell a story. It's supposed to be based on the history of the greatest cinematographers out there like J.J. Abrams, Steven Spielberg and Tarantino. This is the Cinema Pro app that created them all. You can see here the tweaks, you can choose your camera resolution uh, lens, you can actually select which of the three cameras to use, stabilizer and a bunch of, I would call them filters, but they're not exactly filters. Anyway, you get the idea. We have a lot of videos and this one, to be honest, should require a tripod and some after shot editing to get proper results. But an expert would certainly get something special from that feature. I'm sure of that. Now, my conclusion for the video, inferior to the OnePlus 7 Pro and one of the best low light videos, except maybe for the darkness. Now, on the connectivity front, well, it, we're not there yet. On the browser front, this is Chrome, and let's load up gsmdom.com. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Let's try again. GSM DOM this time. That's more like it. Let's see our website on this vertically scrolling phone. A lot more space for the articles. Loaded decently fast. We got a keyboard here with swipe. And that's the browser experience. I previously mentioned my mistake, the connectivity, and now it's really time for the connectivity. You got single SIM or dual SIM versions of the phone. You have the SIM tray at the top. It doesn't require a metal key. You just pull it open by pulling with your fingernail this little space here. Other than that, there is an USB Type-C port at the bottom, USB Type-C 3.1. There's a 4G LTE category 19 or 13. 4x4 MIMO, Wi-Fi A, B, G, N, A, C, there's GPS, and there's also GLONASS, there's Bluetooth 5.0, there's uh, NFC, and PlayStation 4 Remote Play, you can control your PlayStation 4 games from this handset, like a joystick. The calls were pretty loud and clear, 
and now it's time to check out the connectivity and when I say check out the connectivity I mean that we've taken some screenshots of the famous speed test let's see what came out of that okay so let me start off with the 4g 272 mega per second downloads not bad 87.2 mega per second uploads once again not bad this is the uh, lte test and then on wi-fi we got as high as 256 mega per second downloads and uh, two, uh, excuse me 25.5 mega per second uploads those are the results achieved here not bad at all flagship worthy and now it's time to cover the software there's not much to say here, it's Android Pie with an Xperia UI on top that's been getting more and more discreet. They're trying to customize things as little as possible. The leftmost home screen is dedicated to Google and it's news and useful info like the weather or maybe a plane you have to catch. And then if you keep the home screen pressed, you got your home settings, your widgets and wallpapers. Your widgets are obviously stock ones. And as I said before, Xperia UI in this hue, it's kept pretty close to the stock Android experience. Okay, so let's see what else we have here. For multitasking, you do a gentle swipe at the top. You got these thumbnails, horizontally scrolling, and I think I have to close a few of them because I've opened quite a lot. And now, if you want to do split screen, you have the regular one, but you also have this one, 21 to 9. And there are actually some predefined apps. If you want to hook up YouTube and Chrome, you got this combo here. And here we go. Right now, we're on both YouTube and both Chrome. So that's one of the examples of 21 to 9 multitasking. And let's see another one. Uh, let's maybe try uh, YouTube and Chrome. No, already done that. Uh, let's try something else. Chrome and Maps. Okay, now you can, of course, also do that in Landscape. Here we go. That's actually even better because you get more space to navigate on a browser and on the maps. And that's the split screen with the new multi-window. There's also a game enhancer here, which is supposed to enhance your gaming experience with features like uh, recording. So you can record your video session only in Full HD, even though you have 4K. Uh, and uh, you also have the data storage option here and some performance enhancements. You got performance prefer, battery life prefer, focus settings, release RAM, high notifications, so you can totally focus on your game. Other than that, there's something called Sight Sense. I'm still trying to get the hang of it. There was also on the Xperia XZ3, and I'm supposed to double press here every once in a while in order to trigger it. I'm triggering it more by mistake than by intention, uh, and it takes a bit of learning. In general, a double tap on the side should maybe trigger it. Uh, it looks like this and it includes a bunch of shortcuts can also be moved here and annoyingly I cannot seem to trigger it it's very hit and miss it should be triggered by simply doing this gentle tap on the side uh, I found that with the fingernail it actually works better nope not this one nope it should be at the here we go, at last. Took a few attempts, but that's about it. You can also move it around. Uh, it's basically touching the area between the screen and the side, and that's how you can activate it. And you can also tweak it. Not very happy with it because it's hit and miss. Now, on the security side, we have the fingerprint scanner right here. I kept it activated for the review, and you can see it in action here. Not the fastest in the world, for sure. Let's try it again, putting the finger here. Not the fastest in the world, but pretty accurate when unlocking the device. Of course, we go here, we have the notifications, we got the quick settings, things feel pretty stock. We got uh, connectivity options, appearance, display, sound, lock screen and security, Xperia Assist with a very nice smart cleaner that optimizes your stuff, uh, accessibility, digital well-being, so you can wind down and cut down on those Facebook and YouTube binge and rabbit holes. And I think that's about it. It's time to talk about the pre-installed applications. Of course, there's quite a few of them. 3D Creator is actually pretty cool. You can scan someone's face or fruit or a pet and then 3D print it. You can create a cake following it or a special statue. Other than that, we got AccuWeather, we got your album, we got Amazon Shopping, games like Arena of Valor, Booking.com, Calculator, Contact, Cinema Pro, which you already saw, Movie Creator, Netflix, which you can actually put the screen to work with and sheets and slides for productivity and a PlayStation app so you can hook up the device to your PlayStation. So that's about it. This has been the review of the Sony Xperia 1. You can probably tell already it's a mixed bag.
and we're off to the verdict and the pros and cons. On the pro side, obviously, it has a solid build and personally, I like the design, but it's very polarizing. Some people do not like it one bit. The screen is good. It's actually excellent when put to good use with a proper 4K HDR video. It's got strong hardware for sure and future proof. The acoustics are okay, uh, except for the bass. The gaming is fine, I actually enjoyed it a lot. The picture clarity was fine, colors are also fine. Uh, very nice low light capture, photo and video. In my book, the software is okay, Android Pie not very customized. And uh, I like the Cine Alta feature, Cinema Pro, Cine Alta, however you want to call it. I can see its potential and I can see people that know what they're doing pulling off some majestic videos. Also, IP68 certification for waterproofing and a good battery rounds up the pros. On the cons, well, it's a slippery phone with an uncomfortable power button placement. Not a fan of the whole dynamic vibration thing. Uh, the speakers have no bass. Picture taking, well, it takes a long while to take pictures during the night time. That's what I noticed. The colors do not pop in the regular pictures I've taken in the park. And stabilization was so-so at best. The wide angle camera did not get to me. It's too curved in the picture area, I mean. Zoom was also underwhelming. Uh, the close-ups took a lot of focusing and that's annoying. And side sense is definitely hit and miss. As far as I know, we don't have 4K 60 frames per second video capture, which is a bad thing. And there's no wireless charging and no audio jack. In the end, this remains an experience of love it or hate it. That's the core of the phone, love it or hate it. It's polarizing for sure. I can sense there will be some pros who will love the phone. And by pros, I mean people who will generate content on it, who will consume content on it, who will watch Netflix on it, the Tiff app, YouTube. So binge watchers who want something special will be very happy. Creators of content with special apps will be very happy. But if you're looking for an all round smartphone, I think the OnePlus 7 Pro may be better for you. It's a powerful phone that makes a compromise in the base of the speaker and also in the camera department yet again. Sony has compromised yet again in the camera department. I'm not happy with the zoom and I'm not happy with the wide angle camera. Basically, I'm happy with one of the three cameras and that more in the low light than in the daytime, believe it or not. So even though Sony was a bit of a benchmark for filming, this time it's actually not, except for the special mode. And it's a bit quirky with this side sense 2129 long aspect. It's an experiment more than anything else. People may not be willing to embrace it because it's different and new. I like it, but I'm not everyone. So in the end, it feels a like a phone that's closer to an 8 rather than a 9. It feels like an experiment and at times feels like a Nokia 9 PureView, but I will not insult it and call it that. I will call it, let's say, maybe an alternative to the Galaxy S10 Plus and Huawei P30 Pro, but for the quirky people who want to consume 4K and generate cool 4K videos. That's about it from gsno.com. The device is priced at $950 and in some countries they throw in headphones with it. Bye-bye.